Constable by C. Lewis Hind, illustrated with eight reproductions in colour. Chapter 2 The Brown Tree A constant communion with pictures, the tints of which are subdued by time, no doubt tends to unfit the eye for the enjoyment of freshness. So wrote the wise Leslie in a chapter narrating certain passages of art talk between Constable and Sir George Beaumont when the painter was visiting the amiable baronet at Cole Orton. The modern world is a little amused by Sir George Beaumont, collector, connoisseur and painter, who, in his own ripe person, precisely and accurately exemplified Constable's criticism of certain French artists. They study, and they are very laborious students, pictures only. Sir George loved art, as he understood the term, and it was not his fault that he could not see eye to eye with the young vision of Constable. Quite content and happy was Sir George. He did not wish to change. Loved art? He had a passion for art. He did not always carry with him upon his journeys Claude's picture of Hagar, in 1826, he presented Hagar, which is now catalogued under the title of Landscape with Figures, to the nation. But he felt so disconsolate without his adored picture that he begged to have it returned to him for his lifetime. That was done. And on Sir George's death in 1828, his widow restored Hagar to the National Gallery. Study Hagar and you have the measure of the art predilections of Sir George Beaumont, collector, connoisseur, painter, patron and friend of John Constable and author of the famous question, Do you find it very difficult to determine where to place your brown tree? Constable's answer is recorded. Not in the least, for I never put such a thing into a picture. Sir George did. Observing the brown trees sprawling in the formal and academic pictures he prized and copied, he reproduced it laboriously in his own works. Apparently, it never occurred to him that those brown trees may once have been green. Sir George, says Leslie, seem to consider the autumnal tints necessary, at least to some part of a landscape. And Leslie is the authority for two oft-told stories about Gaspard Poussin and about the Cremona fiddle. Sir George, having placed a small landscape by Gaspard Poussin on his easel, close to a picture he was painting, said, Now, if I can match these tints, I am sure to be right. But suppose, replied Constable, Gaspar could rise from his grave. Do you think he would know his own picture in its present state? Or, if he did, should we not find it difficult to persuade him that somebody had not smeared tar or cart grease over its surface and then wiped it imperfectly off? The fiddle story can be told in fewer words. Sir George, having recommended the colour of an old Cremona fiddle for the prevailing tone of everything in nature, Constable answered by laying an old fiddle on the green lawn before the house. Sir George Beaumont was one of the last of the servile disciples of Claude Lorraine and the Poussons who conjured their followers into believing that a landscape must be composed in the grand or classical manner and must conform to certain academic rules. Claude's drawings, preserved in the British Museum, proclaimed that he could be as frank, delightful and impulsive as Constable in his sketches. 
But when Claude constructed a landscape of ruined temples and fatuous biblical or legendary figures, the inspiration of his drawing usually evaporated. Claude's genius remained. There are pictures of him notably, the enchanted castle, that in their particular manner have never been surpassed. But alas, it was not the genius that Sir George Beaumont imitated, but Claude's mannerisms and limitations. The stay-at-home Dutchmen, who flooded the 17th century with their simple, homely and often beautiful landscapes, had no attraction for grandiose Sir George and his kin. The genius of Watteau, which flashed into the 18th century, the commanding performances of Richard Wilson and Gainsborough in landscape, had no influence upon the practitioners of the grand manner. And in truth, those pioneers suffered for their temerity. Wilson, who never quite cast off the classical mantle, accepted with gratitude, at the height of his fame, the post of librarian to the Royal Academy. Gainsborough would have starved had he been obliged to depend upon landscape painting for a living, and Constable would have been in financial straits had he been obliged to depend for the support of his family entirely upon the sale of his pictures. Wilson died in 1782, Gainsborough in 1788, and J. R. Cousins, whom Constable described as the greatest genius who ever touched landscape in 1799. But the careers of these men cannot be said to have influenced their landscape contemporaries. While Wilson, Gainsborough and Cousins were still alive, Certain boys were growing up in England who were destined to make the 19th century splendid with their landscape performances. What a galaxy of names! Old Crome and James Ward were born in 1769, Turner and Gertin in 1775, Constable in 1776, Cotman saw the light in 1782, the year of Wilson's death. David Cox in 1783, Peter De Wint in 1784, and the short and brilliant life of Bonington began in 1801. But landscape painting was still, and was to remain for long, the Cinderella of the arts. In 1829, Cotman wrote a letter beginning, My eldest son is following the same miserable profession. Constables, British contemporaries, being men of genius of various degrees, men of individual vision, it is quite natural that his influence upon them should have been almost negligible. Turner, Old Chrome, and so Bonington owed nothing to Constable, but in France it was different. The in the early years of the 19th century, when Englishmen were producing magnificent fashion, work, um, which, which just, was to um, bring them such the great time. posthumous fame and such small rewards during their lifetime, landscape painting in France was still slumbering in classical swathing bands. As if frightened out of originality by the horrors of the French Revolution of 1789, the landscape painters of France for 30 years and more remained steeped in the apathy of classicism. David, David, 1748-1825, to dominated the French art world, and no mere landscape painter was able to dispel the heavy tradition that David imposed in historical painting. True, there were protesters, original men, there always are, but they were powerless to stem the turgid stream. There was Paul Huet, and there was Georges Michel, happy no doubt in their work, but unfortunate in living before their time. Michel, neglected, misunderstood, was excluded from the Salon exhibitions after 1814 on account of his revolutionary tendencies. We note signs of the brown tree obsession in Michel's spacious and simple landscapes, but he painted the environs of Paris 
and did not give a thought to theatrical renderings of Plutarch, Theocritus, Ovid or Virgil. France was ripe for Constable at that memorable Salon of 1824. Simple, straight-seeing Constable, who painted his Suffolk Peerish, not the, the tumbling ruins of Italy, and he showed that the sun shines, that the wind blows, that water wets, and that air and light are everywhere. But Constable's influence on the French painters, although great, must not be overstated. Change was in the air. Herald signs had not been lacking of the rebirth of a French landscape painting. The French critics of the salons had already begun to complain of the stereotyped classical ruins and brown tree landscapes. They announced that they were weary of malarious lakes, desolate wastes and terrible cliffs. Joyfully, they welcomed in the Salon of 1822, the brilliant watercolours of Bonington, Copley Fielding and other Englishmen. And then came 1824 with Constable, showing that the bright, fresh colours were also possible in oil and that a fine picture could be made out of an unpicturesque locality. A lock, a cottage, a hay wain, a cornfield quite as well as from a plague among the Philistines at Ashdod, or an embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. As has been already explained, Constable did not dream of the success and fame that was in store for him in Pieris. The Haywain was painted in 1821. He was then 45 and as will be seen from the following letter written in 1822, he had not found art remunerative. I have some nibbles at my large picture of the Haywain in the British Gallery. I have an offer of £70 without the frame to form part of an exhibition in Paris. I hardly know what to do. It might promote my fame and procure me commissions, but it is the property of my family. Though I want money dreadfully, and on this subject I must beg a great favour of you. Indeed, I can do it of no other person. The loan of £20 or £30 would be of the greatest use to me at this time, as painting these large pictures has much impoverished me. In 1824, the nibble became a bite. The Haywain, with the two other pictures, was sold to a Frenchman for £250. The Frenchman's object was to make a show of them in Pieris. He did so to some purpose. And it is odd to note that the name of this far-seeing Frenchman has never been disclosed. Above the Haywain, in the National Gallery hangs James Ward's fine picture called View of Harlech Castle and Surrounding Landscape. That is the official title, but I suggest that the title should be The End of the Brown Tree. You will observe that the brown tree has been cut down and is being hurried away in a cart drawn by four grey horses. I do not accuse the director of the National Gallery of joking, but I cannot think it was altogether without intention that in the rehanging of the room, James Ward's allegory of the end of the brown tree should have been hung above Constable's Haywain, the pioneer picture of the new movement. Plate 3. The Cornfield or Country Lane National Gallery. Painted in 1826 and presented to the National Gallery in 1837 by an association of gentlemen who purchased it of the painter's executors, a typical work, John Constable was pleased with his cornfield. Writing of it to Archdeacon Fisher, he said, It is not neglected in any part. The trees are more than usually studied, well defined as well as the stems. 
They are shaken by a pleasant and healthful breeze at noon.